Don Mesh, um, after attending Harvard University as an undergraduate and obtaining his MD from Mesh Med Rush Medical College in Chicago, Dr. Mesh uh, completed residency training in both internal medicine and psychiatry. He has practiced both general internal medicine and general adult psych uh, psych psychiatry in the Chicago metropolitan area. From 1992 to 2003, Dr. Mesh served in various roles, including the Director of Education for the Department of Psychiatry and Health Behavior at the Medical College of Georgia. He returned to the Chicago area in 2003 in the role of, of uh, Executive Director at the Northeastern University Health Service. In July of 2010, Dr. Mesh became the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Health and Wellness and Director of the Waldenburg Health Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. He was selected as, as, he was selected as a Carnegie Scholar in 2001 and 2002 and a co-director of the Georgia Published Papers on Alcohol and Drug Abuse among College Students, Psychotherapy, Suicide, Sexual Assault, Medical Professionalism, and Empathy. And I also want to introduce Linda Cook because she will come up subsequent to his presentation. Linda Cook is a judge and she began working with collective impact models in 1995 in the juvenile justice system in Boulder, Colorado. She was appointed to the Boulder Municipal Court in 2001 and became the presiding judge in 2002. Judge Cook has worked with officials from the City of Boulder and the University of Colorado at Boulder, as well as with a variety of community stakeholders to develop a coordinated response to high-risk substance use and its impacts on the community. Since 2010, she has been the co-chair of Boulder's Community Campus Coalition, aware of Boulder's history as one of the a matter of degree grant sites that failed to earn renewed funding. Judge Cook has been an avid proponent of evidence-based environmental management strategies. Following passage of Amendment 64 to Colorado voters in 2012, Judge Cook's work has expanded to include strategies for addressing the anticipated impacts of recreational marijuana. Please join me in giving them a very warm welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, no, we did not partake of marijuana at that meeting. Yes, we did talk about it. Um, this is a little awkward with the computer here, but I am at a difficult life phase where bifocals, trifocals, it doesn't matter, I can't focus. So hopefully this will not uh, fall over. I want to thank Beth and uh, the ITGA for inviting us and Clemson University and the town of Clemson for welcoming us here. It really has been nice. Um, uh, as you know, we host, both CU Boulder hosted uh, ITGA three years ago and it's, I've had people come up and, uh, from that meeting, which has been nice as well. What we're going to do, Linda and I are going to split the time. We're going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes each. Um, then take questions at the end. And then we have a breakout session at 2.45 where we will continue to present some material and do more questions. Uh, I want to just add one other clarification. You tend to think that the whole world is about you. I realize that CU and CU are not the same thing. So when I refer to CU, I am talking about the University of Colorado at Boulder. I realize that there are a lot of people here who think CU means Clemson. All right, um, so let me just uh, uh, plunge in. The way we're gonna do this, I'm gonna talk mostly about the health effects of marijuana, good and bad, and Judge Cook is gonna talk more about the legal issues. So let me just point out that across the world, in the United States, on American college campuses uh, and so forth, the number one drug of abuse is, remains, and will always will be alcohol. But across the planet Earth, in the United States, the number two drug of abuse is marijuana. And coming up fast, number three are prescription medications. I put some 
and I don't know if I can show you this or not. I just wanted to give you some very quick statistics. I don't know if you can read that. This is the prevalence of marijuana use by 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. Uh, this data is from 2012. And if you can, I don't even know if it'll show. OK, let me just tell you. If you look at um, the first row here is, is marijuana. And you'll see that if you look in the green, 11% of 8th graders have used marijuana in the past year, 28% of 10th graders, and over a third of 12th graders. What's even more disturbing is if you go all, all the way over to the red, you'll see that 6.5% of 12th graders use marijuana daily. That's really remarkable. I will talk a little bit about it later, but on the bottom of the slide in the green, it's the percentages of synthetic marijuana. 11% of, of uh, 12th graders in this country had used some form of synthetic marijuana in the past year, and that was in 2012, so I'm presuming it's higher now. So that's just to give you some idea. And just so you know, within the college population, if you look at the last part of this slide, the bottom, 16% of college students acknowledge using marijuana within the last 30 days. I will tell you at CU Boulder, it's a little higher than that. Um, considerably higher than that. Uh, although there's use and there's use. Smoking a joint once a month is very different than being a chronic, frequent, regular, heavy, daily user. So let me tell you what I'm about here. I, I'm a data guy like a lot of people here. Um, and I'm trying to be very honest about what the data does and doesn't show. And I'm fine to have the data lead us to wherever it leads us. I'm not necessarily trying to make a political point, although I have plenty of political points. But when I'm talking about data, I'm trying to be as objective as I can. So I'm not going to belabor this, but I just want to point out that it is difficult to study marijuana. It's difficult because it's been an illegal drug and still is federally. So that limits the sorts of studies you can do and even the marijuana samples you can look at. But when you look at marijuana studies, it's, it's difficult for other reasons. How much did somebody smoke? Well, I don't know what the THC concentration was in that particular joint. How long have they been smoking? When did they start? Um, when you look at the effects of marijuana, you have to separate out confounds like alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use. Did people who use marijuana present with psychiatric problems or develop them afterwards? Much of the studies that have been done are self-report and retrospective, which has its own difficulties. How do you measure THC? And I'm also going to point out that there's a significant difference between human and animal studies, but they both matter. So I'm not going to belabor these points again, except to say that marijuana research is difficult. And I'm going to try and be very clear about what I think we do know and what I think we don't know. So what's uh, the 411 on THC? Cannabis has at least 500, they keep going up, known compounds. And at least 70 of them are called cannabinoids, so that they're really related to cannabis itself. As you know, the primary psychoactive constituent in marijuana is THC, but there are a bunch of other uh, cannabinoids in cannabis that have complementary and or antagonistic uh, effects. The one you probably hear about the most is uh, cannabidiol, which I'll talk about. So, um, and again, I just want to emphasize that uh, this research was not based on personal experience. Um, I told my son, who was pre-med, uh, that unlike Bill Clinton, I'm not going to deny that I inhaled in college, but I only, I only inhaled to the bifurcation of my trachea. <laughs> None actually entered my lungs. This is why he doesn't believe a word I said. <laughs> and this is an example of that, because the distinction is made between cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. I'm not so sure that these distinctions are actually as true as most people think. I would point out that much of the marijuana you get can be a blend. But nonetheless, the notion is that sativa is higher in THC and lower in, in cannabidiol. And it's more energizing, stimulating. It makes you more creative, uh, uh, can counteract depression. In, in theory, indica is more medical marijuana. It gives you less psychological lift than a body buzz. 
and it's uh, alleged to have uh, all the effects you've heard about with marijuana, pain reduction, and muscle relaxation, decrease in anxiety and stress, reduction in seizures, and so forth. I don't think these distinctions are as clear as they make them out to be, but just so you're aware. So I don't know how many of you have been smoking dope lately, um, and I'm probably not going to ask for a show of hands, although it would be interesting. Uh, <laughs> but for the, so I just thought I'd talk a little bit about how do you consume marijuana, because it's not like the old days where you just smoke the stuff, OK? Um, for those of us who did inhale at any point in our lives, typically, for those of us who are older, we did it through pipes or bowls or joints. And the notion was that smoke would go directly, marijuana smoke would go directly from burning marijuana into your lungs. Water pipes, blongs, and hookahs, I still don't understand the distinction, but many people claim there are some, uh, are certainly, you know, hundreds and thousands of years old. But the notion of a water pipe is that you filter smoke through water before you inhale it. Therefore, it's not as hot, it's cooler, um, uh, not as irritating to the lungs. More recently are vaporizers. Now, you all know about e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes have become a serious problem for a variety of reasons related to e-cigarettes. But it hasn't taken long for people to realize that you can take something like hash oil, put it in your e-cigarette, vaporize it, and inhale it. So the notion here is that when you vaporize something, you release the components of marijuana, but you don't have to actually burn it. You don't have to get to the point where it combusts. And the notion is that actually you probably get fewer contaminants, tar, and carcinogens by doing it that way. One of the issues that's come up with vaping, however, is that it's hard for anyone to know what you're smoking, which is, of course, exactly what smokers want if they're going to smoke in public, but presents a problem if you're in law enforcement or elsewhere. What's the minimum you need to know about marijuana pharmacology? Just remember, there's a difference between getting high when you're acutely intoxicated with marijuana, residual effects where you still may have the effects of having smoked marijuana, but there's no longer any in your body, and then the important question of long-term effects. Does marijuana do stuff to you that doesn't go away? And for long-term effects, what we're typically concerned about are, are chronic, frequent, heavy, daily users. Um, I think we'll skip that. So I, I want to talk uh, very briefly about edible pharmacology. As you know, especially with the passage of Amendment 64 and Colorado and the similar uh, changes in the state of Washington, marijuana edibles are really on the rise. And I think one of the things we're seeing is that they're considerably more dangerous than people suspected. And that's for two reasons. One reason is that they often have very high concentrations of THC. So it's not the stuff you're typically smoking in a joint. It's hash oil and other preparations that are very high potency THC. But there's a bigger problem with marijuana edibles. The problem is that when you eat something, you don't experience the effects as quickly as when you smoke something. And what this means is that if you're a guy like me, and you see brownies in front of you, I eat brownies till there are no more brownies, OK? <laughs> the problem with this is you can eat a lot of brownies, cookies, or other stuff, not have any idea how much marijuana you've consumed, and then suddenly it explodes on you. And this is why we're getting more and more reports of kids going, kids, young children, older children, adults going to the emergency rooms, particularly after having eaten marijuana, a marijuana-infused uh, uh, product. Uh, increased reports of pets being taken to the hospital having eaten infused products, although I doubt they knew that's what was in it, uh, unless you have a very intelligent and interesting pet. And there's been a variety of reports of death uh, related to marijuana edibles. So I want to point out the fact that it's, it takes longer to feel the effect is actually probably more dangerous in this context. So the question of marijuana potency. Uh, the government had been saying, and various others had said that this is not your grandmother's, actually it was my grandfather's marijuana, actually it was my grandmother's marijuana, um, <laughs> and my mother's. Um, 
she was so thoughtful. I went to college in 69. Her going away present to me was a gas mask, assuming I would be involved in riots. And it turned out I used them my freshman year. Um, so enough about me. Anyway, um, the claims have been made that marijuana potency had increased 20 to 30 to 50 times over the last 20 to 30 years. In general, that simply wasn't true. And uh, there's various monitoring stations. The one that most people are aware of is the University of Mississippi, uh, had showed that from the 70s or early 80s, marijuana potency on the street had probably doubled or tripled. So on the one hand, I think those claims are greatly exaggerated, except that as of the last couple of years, I now start to agree with it. And the reason I agree with it is because of high potency forms of marijuana that are increasingly being distributed. So here's the bad news. Marijuana typically has somewhere between half a percent and 10% THC, the primary psychoactive constituent. And as you know, it's made from the, the leaves and tops of marijuana uh, plants. They're dried, you typically smoke them. Hashish or hash can be two to 20% THC. Hash oil, which is the stuff that is frequently put in uh, e-cigarettes or, or that is vaporized, can have up to 50% THC. But it gets worse. There are now hash oil concentrates or extracts. And uh, I won't give you the details of how it's done. It's often done with butane and or carbon dioxide. Butane is a good way to blow yourself up, sort of like a crystal meth lab, although the thing is not exactly the same. Here the THC content can be even higher, 75% or more. There's something called wax, and you can sort of see a picture of it there, which is like hash oil, but it's a sort of, it's also called earwax. It looks like earwax. It's sort of a goopy consistency. Something called shatter can be up to 90% THC. And it's this semi-transparent amber colored, uh, 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 it's described as a cake. And the reason it's called shattered is when you, when you break it, it, it cracks as if it were shattering. So these are very high concentrations of THC, not like what you and I or others used to be smoking. So how do you consume marijuana? Sounds like I'm promoting marijuana, I just realized this. <laughs> this is not my goal, I want you to be aware. <laughs> I have a few samples in my bag. Um, for us old folks, you did it the old way, reefer madness, right? You wrapped your own, which I don't think anybody does anymore, kids today. Um, you wrapped your own, you rolled your own joint and you smoked it. Um, so people still do that. And the THC concentrations are probably less than that than the other things I'm going to tell you about. I talked to you about vaping. You fill in what is a, basically an e-cigarette with some hash or some marijuana concentrate and then in effect smoke it. There's something called dabbing. And the notion is that you take a goop or a dab of marijuana, concentrate of some sort, so high THC. You place it on a heated surface. So what you see here is basically a nail and you vaporize it and then you inhale it. There's the edibles and infused products, uh, brownies, cookies, lollipops, you name it, things to drink. And another way that marijuana is consumed these days is by tincture. So it's a liquid concentrate and you can put it in food or drink, but a good way to, from the point of view of those who wanna get high to use it is to actually put it on your tongue or even better under your tongue and you get rapid absorption. All right, so how dangerous is marijuana? By golly, there's some actual data. A guy named Nutt, N-U-T-T, -T, from England, did a study called Drug Harms in the UK. And I'm not sure if you can see this here, but what he tried to quantify was exactly how dangerous are various drugs to the user himself or herself, psychologically, physically, occupationally, and so forth, and how dangerous is a drug to society as a whole? So here's what he found. If you look at this, and I probably, again, I'm not sure you can see it, but I can tell you the general deal. As you go to the right, you're looking at increasing harms to a user himself or herself. As you go up, you're looking at increasing harms to society in general. 
So the circled thing at the top, the all-time winner, the drug that is most dangerous to both individual users and society, as usual, is alcohol. The drugs that were most harmful to individuals, per se, on the right side of this chart, were heroin, crack cocaine, and methamphetamine. And if you look, the circle, uh, on the, more or less on the bottom left, is cannabis. And I think that this data is really right. What it shows is that cannabis is not the most dangerous drug in the, cons in the cosmos, but it's also on this chart, meaning it is not as benign as many people want to believe, especially in higher concentrations. So, um, yeah, I'll go on. So let me talk about marijuana's effects when used in puberty or adolescence. Puberty is a very important developmental time. It's a sensitive period in human development. It's a critical window. And there's a bunch going on in your brain at this time. I'll tell you what's not going on. You're not making lots and lots of new neurons, nerve cells. You've already done that. What's going on in puberty and adolescence, though, is equally important. And there's three things that happen. One is what's called pruning. Your brain starts to say, oh boy, I made all these neurons, but you know what? They're, all, they're going all over the place and I don't know what I'm thinking and I can't think clearly. Does this sound like an early adolescent? <laughs> and your brain says, I gotta get rid of some of this stuff. So what you prune is very important. There's also changes in how neurons connect to each other. And the other thing that goes on at this time is a lot of myelination. So the notion here is you take nervous system connections that are sort of like a country road and you make them into super highways. So this is really important. And at the same time in puberty and adolescence, what you're getting is maturation of neurotransmitter systems. So all those serotonin and dopamine and all those chemicals you've heard about are being remodeled and the connections are changing. So as you can guess, when you're dealing with a developmental period, it's a really bad time to mess with the human brain. Okay, because stuff's happening that if you mess up that development, it may not go away later. Well, it turns out that there's a natural can a cannabis system in the human body and that the brain naturally produces some substances that are, just, that are very much like cannabis. And their role is to suppress or activate other neurotransmitter systems and to help regulate this development. In fact, it turns out that the natural cannab cannabinoid system in the human brain is most active, guess when? Puberty and early adolescence, which is why it's a really bad time to mess with this. So here's what many of us are concerned about. Heavy marijuana use in puberty and mid-adolescence can have effects on both the structure of the brain, the physical structure, and how it functions and that those changes may be very different than what happens if you smoke as an adult. So smoking in puberty may have long-term effects on all sorts of stuff that won't go away till later. So, and one of the things related to that is that animal studies have shown, have at least raised the possibility that if you use marijuana in early adolescence, it may prime your brain to be more sensitive to drug abuse. It may result in more drug seeking and drug taking behavior. And that if you do this, if you take the same amount of marijuana as an adult, it doesn't have that effect. So this is going to be a very quick and high level overview because this, con this topic has so much content. But um, if you have specific questions, I urge you to come to the breakout session later on and we'll try to answer um, those. I am um, not nearly as funny as Don. Um, I apologize in advance, but so I'm the straight man to his comedian. Okay, I want to start out with a couple of abbreviations that you'll see throughout my slide. MJ for marijuana, that's pretty well known. In Colorado, we talk about MMJ for medical marijuana and RMJ for recreational or retail marijuana. And MIPS, for me, those are MIPs, uh, minor in possession of alcohol, but in the new marijuana world, it's Mara infused product manufacturers, so that the people are making the edibles and so forth. So here's the history of how we got to uh, legal marijuana. Um, before 1996, it was in the illegal in all states, um, and punishment could vary, but in some places it could include incarceration and fines. 
It was first decriminalized in Oregon in 1973, and decriminalization means that you are making it a low-level violation. Um, it's a low priority for law enforcement, and typically the, re the um, consequences are treatment and or fines. So in Colorado, before um, we had any type of legal marijuana, it was a $100 fine for, for possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. Um, the history of legalization nationally in 2014 today, it is still illegal everywhere under federal law, notwithstanding what state legislators may have done. But the first state to legalize medical marijuana was California in 1996 when they passed Proposition 215. Um, we now have 22 states in the District of Columbia which allow broad medical marijuana use and another nine states that allow limited medical marijuana use. So in total, we have more than half of the country is allowing some version of medical marijuana. So medical marijuana um, was actually legalized in Colorado in 2000, but it didn't become a big thing until 2009 when the um, federal government issued their Ogden memo. And in that memo, what they did was they stated that um, prosecution would be a low priority in states where medical marijuana is legal, um, as long as they were, as people were staying away from certain thing, and there was, I'm not going to go into all of those, but there were sort of eight things that they were staying away from. So if you're still trafficking in marijuana, the feds are going to get involved. If you have marijuana in very close proximity to schools, the feds are going to get involved. But if you kind of stay within the, is allowing some version of it, they were not going to take a real hard look. Um, so then we have this explosion of medical marijuana. Um, dispensaries in uh, Colorado and I'm, and I'm sure many other places as well. And then in 2012, Colorado and Washington voted to mar uh, legalize marijuana for recreational use. So this is, an, uh, this is a map that changes regularly. This is as of April 13th. Um, I don't know if you can, I think you can see it pretty well, but it basically shows you what the status is in your state. You can look it up there and see. By the way, Minnesota um, has just changed over and now um, allows medical marijuana. So here's the public view of legal marijuana. 78% uh, of people across the United States favor, favor legal medical marijuana. It's a little bit harder to tell what people think about um, recreational marijuana. And there's, um, you can see there's several different polls from October up through um, late May. It seems that um, support may be waning just a little bit from where it was last October, and maybe that's a result of some of the experiences that Colorado and Washington have had. But at least at, back in October, over 50% of the um, folks nationally favored recre legal recreational marijuana as well. And regardless of whether people favor it or not, 75% believe that marijuana will eventually be legal nationwide. Um, here's a landscape of the states that are considering marijuana legislation. I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time on that, but if you're interested in your state, look in the materials. Okay, um, moving on. Marijuana, fact versus fiction. So these are common beliefs about marijuana, and these are some of the beliefs that are put out there when there is a campaign to legalize marijuana. So is it true that marijuana is not addictive? That's not true. Um, and admissions for marijuana treatment are high. Is it safer than al alcohol or tobacco? True, you saw what um, Don presented, but it does still carry some risks. Mar marijuana is all natural, implying how could it be bad if it's all natural? Whether well, a lot of other things that are all natural as well. <laughs> marijuana helps with stress and anxiety. Well, in fact, in most people, or in many people, it increases anxiety. And so people think that they're using it to alleviate anxiety, and it's um, not particularly helpful. And that marijuana helps with serious medical conditions. This is a place where this very well could be true, but more research is needed. And because it has been an illegal substance, it has not been widely studied. Um, and finally, marijuana doesn't kill. Um, I'm sure these probably made national headlines, but um, for those of you who don't know, the young man on the left is a college student from Wyoming who came down to Denver to um, partake of recreational marijuana. He did it in the form of an edible. He was 19. He didn't purchase it himself, but one of his of-age friends did it. 
And he did what Don said, which is he didn't feel the effect immediately, so he started consuming more and more. And he basically um, just became out of control and jumped off the four-story balcony of the hotel he was staying into his death. Um, the woman in the picture on the right, her husband had, cons oh, and the testing showed that this young man had consumed only marijuana. It was not, there was no alcohol, there were no other drugs, it was simply marijuana. Um, the woman on the right was a mother of three. Her husband had been take, had, had some marijuana edibles along with some other um, substances. They believe prescription drugs, possibly alcohol. He um, essentially became psychotic and was um, holding her or holding her at gunpoint. She managed to get into the bathroom, called 911. Uh, part of the big tragedy of that story was the very slow 911 response, but he ended up um, shooting and killing her. So. It's not true that marijuana doesn't kill. It's, it's not one of those things that you see a lot of overdoses like you do to the extent with alcohol or other drugs, but it's a very sobering fact. Okay, issues for cities and towns. And a lot of these issues apply to universities as well, but I wanted to um, start out with this. If you are going to legalize marijuana, whether it's recreational or medical, there are all these issues that you need to address. Will you allow it to be grown um, only inside or, in out, or outside as well. Um, if you're going to only grow it inside, all of a sudden your real estate for warehouses is going to increase in value overnight. Where are you going to locate it? The feds have put out this 1,000 foot rule, so if everything is outside of 1,000 feet of a school, a daycare, certain other types of facilities, you're probably good. Um, density, what kind of density are you going to um, allow? Electrical capacity, it takes a lot of electricity to grow marijuana. Um, do you have the bandwidth to handle that? Um, is there a clean energy opportunity? In Boulder, Colorado, they made all of the uh, marijuana um, industries be zero energy. So, yep, there's an opportunity there. Um, where's the water going to come from? And, if, of course, you can't use federal irrigation water. And what kind of limits are you going to put on the number of plants per person or per household? Where and how will marijuana be sold? Any location, any retail location in your city, or are you going to have some limitations? In Boulder, we don't allow it in mixed-use development because there are residences on the upper stories. Do you want it in your prime commercial district at street level? Um, again, you have the 1,000-foot rule, the limit. Um, how are you going to deny access, access to minors, and what kind of signs do you want to allow? This is a picture of a... a sign outside a marijuana dispensary in Boulder. How is it and where will it be consumed? Um, Don has already talked about how it will be consumed, but what kinds of limitations are you going to put on people consuming it on their own property, if any, um, for places where there are rental properties or public housing? What about your public spaces and out-of-town visitors? Marijuana uh, tourism is um, becoming an industry in Colorado, but where are those people going to consume it, particularly, for instance, if, illegal, if it's illegal in hotels? And then um, where, whether or not you're going to have marijuana clubs um, and how about issues of edibles and vaping, which are more discreet. Um, here's, a, again, on vaping, here's a, law, a map of the laws about the, where you can vape legally. This was put together by the e-cigarette industry. But most of us have not thought about this, and most places don't legislate about vaping at this point. Um, other sit issues, um, excise sales and use taxes. Are you going to impose these? What, how are you going to collect them? And very importantly, how are you going to spend it? Um, what about your licensing and inspection capacity, and what kind of fees are you going to charge for that? If you're a, a city government, What's your policy going to be for medical marijuana use and recreational marijuana use by your employees? Um, are you ready for neighborhood um, conflicts around marijuana use? And um, again, marijuana tourism. One of the, um, the articles that was in one of our local um, TV channels recently was that Colorado had become a big alternative spring break destination for college students um, because of the marijuana tourism industry. And finally, um, things that we would not have predicted, um, predictably patients moving to the state so that they can use the medical marijuana, but unpredictably the increase in homeless people um, in the Pueblo area, probably in Boulder as well, because they want to be able to use marijuana legally. 
Um, then there are a number of safety concerns you need to be worried about. Drug driving, um, we've already seen a tripling in fatal crashes involving marijuana use, and this was even before any recreational marijuana was legalized. And in the same time frame, alcohol um, fatal crashes stayed the same. Um, blood tests for THC content in driving under, the, or driving under the influence of drugs cases has gone up dramatically. This is just 2009 to 2011 in Colorado, um, but that's indicative of the, of the fatalities as well. Um, hash oil explosions. Um, these are very similar in result to the meth explosions that Don was talking about, but you can see we've um, had a big rise already, a tripling just in the first part of 2014 over what we saw in 2013. And then these hash oil explosions has all, have had the um, related consequence of admissions to the burn unit. Um, ingestion, accidental ingestion is a huge issue. Um, Accidental ingestions of marijuana in any in states where they have any legal form of marijuana has tripled. Um, emergency department visits have increased, especially for child patients, and also um, the veterinarians report increased um, cases where pets have accidentally in, um, ingested marijuana. And I actually had one of these cases in my court a few years ago, and it happened not once, but um, several times with this same owner and their dog. And we finally had to have that dog monitored monthly by a veterinarian to make sure that it wasn't getting any more because we were concerned about this. It was the, the, the owners were very negligent. Oh, I guess in, you saw those edibles look like candy. They look like candy, they look like baked goods. Um, so it's very easy to mistake them for something that's very attractive to children. Crime. One of the things people have been concerned about is, is crime going to increase if we legalize marijuana? Well, so far, crime has not increased since um, recreational marijuana became legal on January 1st of this year. Um, drug driving has increased. Uh, law enforcement has become pretty apathetic about enforcing a lot of marijuana violations because of the proof issues. So unless there are some really large grows that are not by certified um, growers, then they're probably going to stay away from it. But certainly in our border states, we are seeing a big exodus of marijuana to those states, and they have very um, real concerns. Okay, implications for colleges and universities in particular. Um, marijuana may be legal, but there's still something called the Drug-Free Schools Act. So um, I'm not aware of any university that has allowed it. Boulder won't allow it. And most of them don't even want to consider accepting um, research money for marijuana because of the implications for them. One of the things that I talk about in court a lot is that uh, marijuana uh, convictions can result in a loss of federal student financial aid. On the FAFSA, there is a question, I think it's number 24, that you have to answer about that. And if you've had a conviction, um, then you lose your eligibility for financial aid for a year. If you've had more than one conviction, then it's um, an extended period of time. And in my court, we do have cases not only for underage drinking, but for underage marijuana use. And those um, students are at risk of that if they don't um, complete the requirements to avoid that consequence. Other impacts for students. So it's illegal to consume marijuana if you're under the age of 21. But if you have a medical marijuana card and you can get that at the age of 18, then it is legal for you to use it. So you will see students who um, come to Colorado uh, and immediately get their medical marijuana card so that they can use medical marijuana legally. Or if they've already lived in Colorado, they have may, may have obtained it before they got to campus. You may see um, requests to live off campus, especially by those medical marijuana card holders, so that they can legally use their medical marijuana because, of course, they won't be allowed to in a campus dorm. Um, students who do live on campus, which is a requirement for freshmen at CU, may consume their, med their marijuana um, nearby in their parked cars. I had one of these cases in my court just a few weeks ago as well. This is a student from another part of Colorado. She has a legal medical marijuana card and she was constantly going over to her car a few blocks off campus and smoking her medical marijuana there. Well, the neighbors were not real happy about it that and they phoned it in, um, but that's another potential impact. And this very big deal, when you are traveling out of state, 
um, having a Colorado license plate when you're driving is considered um, by Kansas, by Nebraska, wherever, reasonable suspicion. <laughs> and I would argue, I would argue that if you're an out-of-state student attending CU and you have a CU Buffs sticker on your window or something, that that may also be reasonable suspicion. So the fact that you don't have Colorado plates may not be enough to protect you. Um, one of my judge colleagues um, is African American and his son attends college in Kansas. He was driving home from Kansas to Colorado um, at the end of the semester and he was stopped four different times, it, his car with Colorado plates. And after the first time, he just phoned his dad at every contact so his dad could overhear all of the interactions. No tickets were ever issued, but that's how much attention um, the law enforcement officials in other states are paying attention. And then at the airport, there are a lot of lot more dogs sniffing um, for marijuana than there ever used to be. They're basically not employable in the rest of the state now since marijuana is illegal. Um, <laughs> But they are all at the at Denver International Airport now. Okay, how do students get and use marijuana? Um, they get the, their medical marijuana cards. They get it from friends. They grow their own and they buy their own. And again, here's some examples of creative ways that they're ingesting their marijuana. And let me see. I do want to allow a few uh, minutes for questions, but let me just talk about a few more things. Reputation management. Um, you all know, you've been seeing reports about this, there's a national audience for marijuana related news and if you're one of the early adopters like Colorado or Washington, you're going to be um, in the spotlight. There are big impacts on tourism, um, potentially positive but also negative, and on um, economic development there may be impacts in that way. And um, the, our college recruiters from CU are reporting that they're hearing about it as well when they go on out of state recruiting trips. Um, interestingly, um, is, so is, reputa is this good for your reputation or not? Well, actually, most people in Colorado, the majority, don't yet believe that that's true unless you're 18 to 20. Okay, this is probably something you all really want to know about. What about the marijuana revenues? Um, the cannabis ex industry is expected to grow 64% this year to more than $2 billion. Um, sales are estimated to exceed $1 billion, with recreational accounting for the um, majority of that. Uh, the state of Colorado could collect $134 million, this is just the state, in taxes for the fiscal year beginning July 1st. Um, Boulder County, which is the county that we're located in, collected $160,000 in re uh, recreational marijuana sales tax just for their first full month of operation. The city of Boulder did not release their statistics. The city of Boulder also has an excise and sales tax because um, this part of the year there have only been two recreational marijuana dispensaries open, and so they didn't want to reveal that because it would identify um, the, the two retailers, but it's, it's big money. Um, if you do legalize, be prepared for the entrepreneurialism that goes along with it. These are some of the jobs in the marijuana industry. Um, here's additional jobs. Marijuana physicians. <laughs> and the new normal. Um, one of the, so if you see, this is a, this is a screenshot of our local newspaper, um, but the red circle, we now have a category, local news, you know, CU news, marijuana is now its own category that's on the um, newspaper every single day. It's rare that a day goes by where there isn't at least one marijuana related story in the newspaper. Um, the Colorado Symphony created the cannabis series. I don't know if you all have heard about that, but you are, you bring your own cannabis and smoke it while the symphony is playing. Um, and various other things. And positing that we are going to have medical or pot vending machines, that's what you see there in the one picture, and the bus that you see, the food truck, so the medical marijuana edible food bus, that's actually from um, 
Washington. But it visited Colorado. <laughs> All right, and so um, we're at the point now where we can take questions. We've got a few minutes left. Don, come on back. And uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Yeah, the question is, how does marijuana affect academic performance? At the breakout session, I'll talk some more about it. But marijuana definitely affects learning while you're high and may have long-term effects on learning as well. I'll talk about it at the next session. But I think, as I said, you have to be careful about the research, but there's a lot of studies that should make us worried, even if they don't prove the case. And I'll talk about those. We have one. Um, their, their per se limit is five nan nanograms. Um, it took three legislative sessions for that to pass because there was a lot of debate about that, and it's the highest in the world. Um, Amsterdam, or Netherlands, I believe, is two. I would also add that I, I have great concern about a per se limit, period, because marijuana is not metabolized in the body the way alcohol is. With alcohol, it's pretty easy to extrapolate backwards and figure out how much you had to drink from what your blood alcohol level was. And there's a clear relationship between your blood alcohol level and the effects. Personally, I and I think there's a lot of other people who think these per se limits for marijuana are not ready for prime time, but they're here. Right, so in Colorado, mobile delivery is not allowed. I understand that um, California may allow that for medical marijuana. Um, for the um, other piece, yes, we license them. We have um, state licensing procedures. Um, the local jurisdictions can also have their own licensing procedures. There are um, licensing fees that are collected and other fees, other because there are some limitations about what you can't, the municipalities can't collect license fees, but they can collect other fees. And so, um, yeah, there's, that's how it's done. It's, and there's a whole department of, um, the Department of Revenue has a whole medical or marijuana enforcement division. I know that you will join me in thanking them. Uh, they are. As you can imagine, when we talked about this in Colorado, we began to realize how complex this topic is because from federal and state and local levels, how they uh, differ, and it was very, it was very intriguing. So I think the conversation will continue for a long time, and I think it's very relevant to our themes and topics. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, Don. Thank you so much, and Linda for coming. We really appreciate.